Imagine loading, preparing to live stream. Everyone, you'll, you'll be on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> so, loading. <coughs> we are live. Should we admit them now? Yeah, yeah, please do. Yeah. All right, let's go. Okay, uh, good afternoon to all our participants. So currently we have a total of uh, 30 uh, participants in this uh, webinar. So uh, I'll give another couple of minutes, couple of minutes more uh, before we, we, we will start just to give uh, other participants to join this webinar. And I hope you can see my screen right now so we will start promptly at 102 uh, and then uh, we'll wait for uh, a bit more a couple of minutes for the other participants to join thank you oh. Okay, so we will start our webinar. Uh, so good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good, good evening, wherever you are, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the first webinar organized by Arafuga and Timor Seas Ecosystem Action, or at C2, and Oil Spill Response Limited, or OSRL. Uh, at C2 and OSRL um, has collaborated this year to deliver quarterly webinars. I am Norman Ramos from Oil Spill Response Limited, uh, the facilitator for today's webinar. So our hope is to share the learnings and have a productive discussions through this webinar. Uh, but before we start, I would like to run through our ground rules. Uh, so first and foremost, we, I, we ask our audience or our participants to be respectful uh, at all times. So when you uh, place a question on your chat box, please do avoid using all capital letters in your chat. Or when you're communicating to the host or co-host, uh, as much as possible, please avoid using capital letters. We would request you to keep your microphones uh, at mute and your videos off. Uh, this is to preserve 
the internet uh, integrity uh, so that there will be no uh, downtime or lag time uh, when you are watching this webinar. As I have mentioned, if you do have questions, please type your messages or your questions in the chat box and we will attend to them. And your questions will be answered during the plenary uh, towards the end of the webinar. And also, just please take note, if ever uh, we are not able to answer the question that you raised during this webinar, uh, don't worry about that. Uh, OSRL will release an online article detailing the answer to the questions that you have uh, that we haven't answered on this webinar. So it's it's uh, it's fine that uh, we are not able to answer today, but we will we will make sure we will answer it in our uh, upcoming online article. Uh, this webinar will be recorded. Uh, please uh, be informed about that, and the recording uh, will be made available uh, in, in the YouTube uh, in OSRL's YouTube. And at the same time, please take note uh, that this webinar is also broadcasted live in at C2 YouTube uh, channel. Uh, later, uh, during the webinar, we would request you to complete the attendance and feedback form. So this will be shared uh, during the webinar. So just make sure you complete uh, that form. Uh, and in that form, we will be also asking you whether you would require uh, whether you would require to have um, a copy of uh, an electronic uh, certificate. Okay, so a quick one. So I just want to share with you the functionalities of Zoom, which is our remote platform for this webinar today. Uh, so as I've mentioned, uh, number one shows you where you can mute and unmute yourself. Uh, but definitely no need for you to speak up for today. So just type in your questions. Uh, please make sure that you are on mute. Uh, in terms of video, uh, this is where you can start, stop your video. But again, we highly recommend that you keep your video off to maintain the internet reliability. Uh, chat box, so you can place your questions here. You can type your questions here on the chat box. Uh, share screen, uh, share screen, we don't, uh, you, you wouldn't be using this. Uh, this will be used by us and the presenters and reactions. So if you have reactions to what we have mentioned, uh, it will be good to see your uh, reactions. Okay, so we will start our uh, webinar proper. Uh, and it is our pleasure, it is OSRL's pleasure to have the regional project manager of at C2, uh, Dr. Andoko Adi Susanto, and he will provide us an overview of the at C2. So, uh, Dr. Handoko, may I uh, invite you to share your screen and talk about at C2. Go ahead, sir. The floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Norman. Very good uh, afternoon, uh, everyone. Welcome uh, to the first uh, webinar on uh, causes fates and impact of marine oil spills, collaboration between OSLR and ATC program today, 24 February, uh, 2022. So allow me to uh, provide a short introduction uh, to the Arafura and Timor Seas Ecosystems Action Program, or uh, well known as ATC, especially for those uh, who just uh, joined us uh, today. Ah, okay. So uh, this map uh, shows the Arafura and Timor Seas uh, bordered by Australia, Indonesia, Timor Leste, and Papua New Guinea. The Arafura and Timor Seas uh, are part of the North Australian Self Large Marine Ecosystem or LME, a tropical marine uh, area located between the Pacific and Indian uh, Ocean. The region uh, extends uh, from the uh, Timor Sea to the Torres Strait, yeah, uh, here, yeah, and then uh, from the Arafu, uh, include the Arafura Sea and Gulf of Carpentaria. The ATS region uh, contains uh, both uh, near pristine and highly threatened uh, coastal and marine ecosystem, 
which uh, play important ecological and economic roles in the four littoral nations. Uh, at sea to project is the second phase of the ETSI program, a regional partnership involving the government of Indonesia, Timor Leste, and PNG with the support from the government of Australia. The objective is to collectively manage uh, high marine and fisheries resources in the ETS region. The HC2 project is GF, a Global Environmental Facility Funded Program, managed and executed under the UNDP. Uh, PEMC manages uh, regional and PNG component. The mandate of the project is to support implementation of the ATS Strategic Action Program or SAP toward regional collaboration. The ATS SAP provides uh, a key framework of action for ATS region to address its uh, major marine and fisheries transboundary issues, namely over exploitation of marine resources, loss and degradation of habitat and key species, modification, degradation, and loss of habitats, marine and land-based uh, pollution, and climate change. The project is cover, covering uh, the following specific sites uh, where key project activities will be undertaken to address uh, the five uh, major transboundary issues. The project has a five-year time frame yeah, uh, and will be implemented under three components yeah, and then uh, nine uh, target outcomes and uh, 23 target outputs. Overall, interventions under these components are aimed to contribute to enhancing the development of the Arafura and Timor Seas region toward uh, sustainability. And under the component, uh, oh, sorry, component two, output 2.2, HC2 aims uh, to reduce uh, marine and land-based pollution in the ATS region. From our uh, regional marine and land-based pollution assessments conducted last year yeah. uh, in collaboration with Dr. Wong Tai Shin, the most uh, serious issues in this region are oil spill and marine debris. The Oil spill is an uh, omnipresent that omnipresent threat yeah, due to numerous oil rigs activity that actively operating in the formerly known Joint Petroleum Development Area or GPDA and other surrounding areas in the North Sea. In our assessment, we develop a modeling using a genome tool use uh, and use a buffalo oil rig uh, model. Yeah. Uh, we can play here, uh, sorry. We can play this uh, modeling. You can see the, the red uh, circle here, the buffalo oil rig. You can see what happened if there is a oil spill incidents. We have a uh, four quadrant here from January to December. You can see for a while. You can see here, moving uh, of uh, if uh, oil spill incidents happen. So uh, yeah, from this modeling result, yeah, the southern coast of Timor here, yeah, and then also Rote Islands are especially vulnerable to oil spill incident. So uh, while oil uh, well development brings the economic benefit to the ATS countries, yeah, the consequences of oil spill incidents uh, would be devastating. Habitat and species as well as economic development can be jeopardized uh, 
uh, by oil spill. Therefore, it is essential to build national and uh, local capacities in order to respond to future incidents. Hence, uh, since the beginning of 2022, we have been working with OSLR based in Singapore to build oil spill preparedness and response in the ATS region. Today's webinar is the first out of four webinars yeah, will be held every quarter throughout this year. The webinar aims to enable information sharing and build capacity of the Arafura and Timor Sea stakeholders on oil spill preparedness and response. To do so, topic discussed in each of the webinar sessions will progress from awareness of oil spill impact to understand oil spill risk and what it takes to respond to oil spill incident effectively. The series of technical webinar is specifically designed to introduce key principles involved in preparing for and responding to oil spill incident. We thank OSLR colleagues, uh, facilitator today, Mr. Norman, our speakers, uh, Mr. Lee Hearn and uh, Ms. Sarina, and all participants. Uh, I saw from the uh, list of registration, there are uh, more than 100 participants from 30 countries. Yeah, yes, I, I noted here from, of course, Indonesia, Nigeria, China, and so on. There are 30 countries uh, registered in this webinar. Hopefully, this event will be useful for all of us uh, to improve uh, marine and fisheries resource management, especially in the ATS region. Finally, let's support the ATS program to build a better ATS for tomorrow. Thank you. Terima kasih. Obrigado Barat. Over to you, Mr. Norman. Hello, Mr. Norman. I was on mute. So thank ah. you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Handoko, for your uh, opening remarks and introducing to us uh, what at C2 is uh, all about. So I will go through quickly um, on the uh, introduction of Oil Spill Response uh, Limited. So for us, uh, Oil Spill Response Limited, so we are the world's leading uh, global oil spill response specialist since 1985. So we are the largest international industry funded cooperative. So actually our uh, members uh, are those environmentally and socially responsible uh, oil and gas and transportation uh, companies. So uh, we are also a global in integrated provider for surface response and both surface and subsea uh, well source control services. So by being a member of OSRL, you can gain to our uh, full suite of expertise. And of course, for any of your response and your preparedness needs on a global uh, basis. So again, who we are, so we're the largest international industry funded cooperative. So we are owned by major oil and gas production and transportation company. Uh, most transportation companies are shipping companies. And what we do provide are the resources to prepare uh, for response and oil spills efficiently and effectively on a global basis. So not only people, uh, but also equipment uh, with regards to responding and for your preparing for oil spills. Right, now uh, I would like to introduce uh, the presenters for today. Uh, so the first presenter will be uh, Mr. Yo Lee Hearn, uh, who will talk about the causes and fates of marine oil spill. And Ms. Sharina Shanavas, uh, she will be talking about um, uh, the impacts of marine oil spill. And really happy and really pleased that these uh, two colleagues of mine join me. So these are, uh, I would say, the what well, the best, one of the best consultants that I work with in our department. So Yo, uh, so Mr. Yo Lee Hearn, he's uh, already like spent 10 years in Oil Spill Response Limited. He has uh, experience in uh, actual oil spill response and has done a lot of uh, preparedness projects and more specifically with regards to working with uh, some government agencies. Uh, while Ms. Sharina Shanabas, uh, she's already about nine years uh, in oil spill response limited and her expertise is mainly on the oil spill preparedness 
So, it's, so she has done a lot of uh, capability reviews, uh, development of oil spill uh, contingency plan for both our members and of course uh, for some of our government uh, clients as well. So without uh, further ado, um, I will get Lehern to share his screen and start his session on um, uh, on the causes and fates of marine oil spill. Now, to all participants, uh, you don't need to wait until the sessions are over. You can proceed to type in your questions in the chat box as early as now or during the presentations. As I mentioned, uh, questions will be addressed on a first come, first serve basis uh, with consideration to the time allotted to the speakers. So, if we're not able to uh, uh, raise your questions today, uh, again, we will release an online article after this. Uh, to answer the questions that you raise but not answer today. So don't worry if your questions are not read or not answered today. So uh, again, without further delay, uh, Lee Hearn, uh, the floor is yours. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Testing my mic. Is uh, everybody able to hear me well? Thumbs up? Yes. And we can hear you well, Lee Hearn. Okay, so thank you everyone for the time for attending to this webinar. So this, I think as what Dr. Han Goko has mentioned, this is the very first of the whole series. And for those who are expecting, uh, we jump right straight into the oil spill world. Uh, just hang on a minute. We have to start from the basic first, which is the causes and fates of uh, marine oil spill. We have to understand the big picture, what is the risk in the region. We have to uh, let everyone, especially most of the participants here should be from the at sea region. How real is the risk of oil spill in your region? And then uh, how, because the behavior of marine oil spill will then affect the strategies and everything that we will discuss later on in the, the seminar series in uh, quarter two to quarter four. I'm also aware that uh, our participants have a range of expertise for, uh, for those who, this of course, this is designed for those who are not, uh, who haven't have much background in terms of oil spill response. So for those who are more technically advanced, feel free to uh, have a discussion towards the end of the plenary. I think your input is definitely welcome. This is, this, this is a, a great opportunity for everybody to share your input. All right, without further ado, let's straight go into the session for my one. So what we'd like to talk about in this session, firstly, uh, of course, to know what are the sources of uh, and causes of marine oil spill. I will also relate this to the uh, SC region, so it's more related to the participants over here. Then next would be what are the key properties of oil, why we know there are so many properties and how one key five properties that will actually affect their behavior when they are in the environment. And lastly, how, how the weathering of the spill oil in the marine environment and how it will actually affect the choice of our response strategies. So these are the three main things that uh, I will be talk, talking about in this session. All right, let's start with the very first one. So what are the main sources of marine oil spill? I think probably everyone is quite aware. I will just show what I have every uh, what I have one in one shot. So uh, mainly you can see uh, they are to do with shipping and, and uh, exploration and production activities. So for shipping, we have drowning, uh, loading and discharging, collision, how failure. So this workers and fire explosions. So these are mainly to do with accident, incident, human failure as part of the operations in the shipping industry. And because they carry a lot of oil, so anything that happens in any of the process, then uh, the oil spill disaster will happen. Then next would be the um, exploration and production activities. We have, we have three over here. So infrastructure integrity, so the, due to wear and tear, uh, lack of maintenance, all this, then uh, that they will be leading to infrastructure integrity, any process failure, and 
Lastly, the most uh, well-known, most famous is the subsea blowout because it will lead to the most devastating uh, impact as we have all seen in the Macondo incident. Well, just one more. I think probably we are not so aware. Natural seepage. This is uh, something that happens every day, naturally because of the movement of the earth crust. So actually oil will be sipping, but in a small and consistent volume. And uh, this will go in the environment. All right, so let's zoom into the exploration and production because this is uh, one of the two that are the main causes. I will talk about shipping later on. So the, from the study by IOGP back in 2017, so there are more than 51 reported spill with more than 100 barrels of oil spilled. There are, there are a lot more with more than one barrel, so I, I do not want to uh, look into those small statistics. So let's zoom into 100 barrel. So out of the 51 reported incident, 35 of them, we know what was the cause. And not surprisingly, we can see the number one leading cause of uh, spill is actually third party damage. That would be mainly due to uh, miscommunication as part, as part of their um, operation or when they are doing uh, contractors work. So they, they do not have a good communication. So they did the body damage. And the next one would be corrosion, which lead to infrastructure integrity. And the rest will be, will be quite uh, small. So I will not zoom into them. So these are the two leading causes. The next is the tanker spill, so shipping incident. We can see over the years from 1970, year to 2018, that is a steady decline in terms of a both big spill. So the, the big spill is, is the blue, the light green color. Not the small spill is light green color and the big spill is the uh, cyan color. So you can see there's a steady decline, but this does not mean we have to, uh, we, we should not pay more attention to this. Uh, in just, this two years alone, I see there are more instances of uh, tanker incidents. So this, this should be something that should be under our radar. And out of the tanker spill, uh, what was the main uh, reason that uh, led to the spillage? So uh, without uh, much surprise, actually number, the top two is actually grounding and collision. So this account for about more than half of the incident in both the big spillage and the small spillage. Okay, so we know this, this are, these are statistics are for global, uh, come from globally. How about in the Arafura and Timor Sea region? What, how, how are they relevant to us? So first thing, um, let's look at the EMP activities. So this chart is, taken in 2001. It's a bit outdated, I know, but this is a very good summary of what's happening in, the, in this region. And I will talk about some updates that's happening uh, in the next slide. So we can see uh, there are quite a couple of um, the developed but not uh, uh, discovered but not developed oil field. So a lot of them around this region and of course, there are some already producing and some already uh, uh, shut down as well. So these are a lot of, we can see this, this are a lot, there are a lot of activities in this region and there are also some going to, uh, some changes happening in the future as well. So what are those? First is the production sharing contract, I think the joint production development area JPDA, I think it has been dissolved and replaced by the latest, uh, latest international law. It's a good news to hear that the, the long dispute between the borders is uh, being, dis uh, being solved. And what happened is that this whole region is uh, being given exclusively to Timor-Leste. And 
the most important uh, field over here right now is the bio -Wundang. This is so uh, developing, uh, uh, producing well, and it's a mature well as well. So as it's maturing, the government definitely want to explore other options. The the next option would be uh, the Greater Sunrise. It is a high potential region. So I think there has been contract awarded to uh, to a few these three uh, blocks over here for development. So we can see, yeah, definitely in the near future, there are going to be increased activities in terms of uh, exploration and production in the sea region. Okay, next one is the shipping route. So we, we saw the tanker as the main uh, the statistic for tankers, but how about in the SC region, how do they, how, what is the shipping condition like? So you can see from the legend here, the different colors represent different type of uh, carrier. So we have mostly container and drag bulk in this region as represented by yellow and uh, light blue. Although they are not carrying oil as cargo, but they do carry a lot of uh, fuel oil as their, uh, as their main source of energy. So they do represent a significant risk that will be uh, present if they are, ship they are going around on the shipping route. So with these two, we definitely can, can say that the risk in the region will not be going any lower than what we have right now. Definitely with the increase in activities and uh, due to the shipping, ship, increase in shipping activity as well because the economy grows, the risk of oil spill will be there and we might be even higher than before. All right, once we uh, know about the, we have know about the, uh, the risk of oil spill, the next, the second thing I would like to discuss today is the, key properties of oil that's relevant to oil spill. We know uh, this is a sample of a oil assay sheet. So a lot of things to look out for. But um, in oil spill, definitely we don't have time to look out to look at so look into so much details for everything. So what are the things that we uh, zoom into? So density, we look into five things. First density, second viscosity, third core point, Fourth, aspirin content, and lastly is the volatility. So let's uh, discuss in more details what each of them means. First, density or specific gravity. It refers to how heavy the oil is. So if it's uh, above one for so specific gravity, it uh, it sinks into water. So if it's below one, then it will float some water. So how how light, the lighter it is, the smaller the specific gravity it will be. And uh, this definitely will have an impact on the type of response strategy later on. I will discuss in details. Next is the viscosity. Viscosity is how thick the oil is. So we have how heavy now. Resistant to flow, then it means uh, that there are high chances of uh, sedimentation. If it's low viscosity means it's more likely to spread, forming a large, larger area for us to clean up on the, uh, on the surface. That is the pore point. Pore point is the temperature below which oil does not flow. It sounds a bit uh, technical. So that, let's just put it into context. So if the oil that I have, example, um, Montara crude, if it is above its pore point, so in, uh, if the pore point is above the sea temperature, then it's not going to flow. And if it's below the sea temperature, then the oil will behave normally just like what we uh, expect it will be. I will have a video to show this. Don't worry if it still uh, confuses you because this is step, uh, definitely something quite technical, difficult to understand. The fourth one is volatility. So this, this one is probably quite, quite, a, quite a common one to everybody. So it's, it's how, how, how likely it evaporates in a, in a given temperature. So if, a, if, if the oil is light, for example, petrol, 
then it's very volatile after like 10 minutes it will disappear once it's being spilled as I put on the roadside. Last one is aspartame content. So aspartame is a heavy compound, heavy element inside the crude oil. So how much of the heavy element it has uh, in, the, in the oil itself. So it has more than 0.5%. It has a high uh, likelihood to emulsify. Uh, to describe emulsification, so this, this, this is an example of emulsified oil. So how do you know if the oil has emulsified? Actually, I would if you if I were to compare it to something that we see normally in our household, it would be like your um, whipped cream. So if you the if you if you use the butter and beat it to the certain after beating it to a certain time, I think it will become a whipped cream. So this is how it looks like. It increases, it increases in volume by a lot and it's very fluffy, give it a very fluffy feeling. Okay, let's look at how, how each of them uh, have in a real life photo. So this, this is something that happened in Singapore. We, were respond, we responded to a spill and the oil is a immediate, intermediate fuel oil. It's quite a heavy and viscous oil. You can see of my colleague has to uh, manually scoop them out because they are too viscous to be collected by the schema that we had at the point of time. The next one is viscosity. So this, this is a rack of uh, test tubes. So a lot of them. And from the left to the right, they, the viscosity is uh, increasing. So once the person overturned it, you can see after five seconds, for, for the very low viscosity of any up until here, immediately they, they will follow the gravity and uh, goes down to the bottom. But you can see as the viscosity increase, the flow start to decrease. So uh, this one is flowing halfway, this one as well. But you can see the very last one, the air bubble is still here, which means the, uh, the it's very, very slowly falling down to the bottom. This is a very viscous, very thick product. And of course, I have a video for PowerPoint. So again, this, uh, this is, these two has, these two are the same oil product and we pour it into two different cups. The first cup is of a higher temperature and the second cup is of lower temperature. So you can see the pore point is below the ambient temperature and it behaves like this. This is, this is just like a common oil that we, uh, we, know, we expect it to behave. What, what about when the pore point is, uh, just, let me clear my ink. What if, if the pore point is below, it's above the ambient temperature because this, this glass of water is very cold and you can see it doesn't flow at all. So it forms a semi-solid light appearance once being spilled in the environment. But this is very important because this definitely doesn't behave like a typical oil anymore. We have to use specific techniques to deal with them. All right, so after looking at the five properties, so they actually can be, uh, they can, they have a complex interaction, interaction with each other and how they can be grouped together to two more general reference, which is a persistent and non-persistent oil. So they, uh, so that would actually be the more easier guidance when we want to respond to uh, when we want to select a response strategy to the oil. So for the persistent oil, uh, definitely it is the uh, viscous, maybe it will emulsify so they do not dissipate rapidly. It has a higher portion of AV fractions and need more active response because uh, definitely uh, it will have a significant environmental impact if we do not do anything. 
The next one is the non-persistent oil. So it's quite uh, common to us because we see petrol, diesel, so those are grouped under non-persistent oil. It dissipates rapidly, generally it's volatile, and usually if it's spray in the environment, we do not need to have a more active response compared to, to the persistent oil. Okay, so the persistency of oil uh, has a range. So how do we actually classify them? So it's being classified to four groups, group one to group four. Group one being the lightest or the, the least persistent and group four being the more persistent. And how, how can, this, this is a general representation of their volume against time spilled in the environment. You can see for group one over here, it, it decreases in volume quickly over time. As, the, as we go to group two, group three, and group four, you can see an interesting behavior is that the volume increases by the, a little bit more, or group three increases substantially, and then it starts to drop uh, after being released. So uh, why, why would it drop? Because uh, of the interaction with the environment. We'll talk about that later. So a quick summary of what the groups uh, behave in the environment. So group one decreases quickly, lasts for many hours. Group two, small increase in volume. And uh, it will, it will uh, decreases in the total volume after a certain amount of time. Group three, you will see large increase of volume, very persistent, lasting from weeks to months. And group four, definitely the, those heavy one, and, uh, but they are very persistent. So I have seen oil that actually last more than 10, 20 years. So those are, those are the really good, uh, heavy group four oil. So, so the, this oil definitely require more active strategy, more active response technique to handle them. Okay, so how are these uh, properties relevant to oil spill? Um, number one, they, they will affect how they weather when uh, interact with the environment. And this combination of the properties and weathering then will be the main driver that change our response strategies uh, when we want to deal with them. Okay, so let's, after looking at all this, let's have a quiz to quickly know if you have absorbed anything so far. So let's uh, study the Montara crude and I will be, have, I'll be opening up a quiz and the uh, two questions you should be, yeah, the quiz is open up now. So you should get to see the two questions and based on the properties that I have provided here, what do you think it will behave? So first question is the density. Let me open my pen, density and the wax content. So wax content is, a, is something similar to aspartame content. So what can you say about the volume and persistence of the spilled oil? Question two is about viscosity and power point. So power point here, viscosity here. So how do you think it will spread if it's being spilled onto the environment? Okay, I see people starting to answer them about 10 so far. I think question one is a bit more tricky because you might have to take more time. Let's have about 30 more seconds before I close the poll. So far, question one, I think I have quite good response. Question two, uh, a more variation in the answer. Yeah, actually that's the real tricky one of the two. 
Okay, the time is up. So if you haven't decided anything, you can just randomly click one and I'll be ending the poll in 10 seconds. Okay, I just ended the poll. And let me share the result with you. So let's see what everyone says. So for question one, uh, I have about 60% of you who have gotten the correct answer. So from the density and with uh, the web content, you can see, you can see uh, it is between group two and three. So definitely at the more, more heavy uh, end and the web content is really high at eleven percent. This is the heavy, how much heavy component it has. It's after spillage and it will remain persistent. So we need to actually do some kind of active recovery to, to ensure it doesn't stay in the environment. Next one is the viscosity and pop point. How will you predict the spread of oil split? Uh, I can see people are, there, are, there are lots of answer. I have one who chose not sure, who is very honest. And the answer will be, it really depends on the sea temperature. So if it's spilled in a very cold uh, region, example, UK, example, uh, any, any, anywhere, anywhere that's not within the tropical region, definitely it will not spread because it, is, it forms the semi-solid appearance, if you still remember. And if it is at a sea region, it might, it depends on, on, the, on the day of the year, that, uh, on the time of the year that it's, it's built, because the at sea region, the sea temperature actually varies from, I think, 20 to 30 degrees. So there are sometimes it's behaved like solid, sometimes it behaved like uh, oil itself. So let's look at what happened in the Montara spill. So did it, we must, we must be very curious, so did it form a semi-solid or did it form uh, the oil behavior? So you can see this, this is fresh oil. Uh, this uh, sheen because oil was spread. You can, so you can tell actually at the time of spillage, it actually spread. So I, if I remember correctly, it spilled at the time where it's hottest in the, in the region. I think the sea temperature was near 29 or 30. So uh, it behaves like this normally as the oil. And because of the heavy component, you can see it quickly emulsified. So it changed in color totally from black to slightly orange. This is after, after a bit of time. And after even more time, it becomes a uh, light orange because of the emulsification. So we, to deal with oil of this kind, this kind, and this kind, it requires a totally different strategy or different schema, or I would say. Okay, so um, I have mentioned about interaction with the environment. So actually the five key properties lead to a uh, different interaction with the environment, and then it will behave differently and uh, will have a different weathering effect. So let's look at what are the weathering impacts. So first, uh, spreading. This is quite, quite uh, common to what we know. It always spread on water, evaporation. Dispersion is something that we do not see with our naked eye. It actually all oil, they will disperse slowly into water column. I will discuss about that. Fragmentation, this, this, this is quite co common as well. Emulsification, I spoke about that. Stranding or sedimentation is when it's impacting the shoreline and biodegradation. There are two smaller uh, process, dissolution and photo oxidation. I will not talk about detail because they are a much smaller part of the whole uh, phase and behavior. So, of course, the, the phase and behavior 
other than the oil properties, they are dependent on the environmental factor itself, such as how strong is the wind, what is the tidal, what is the current condition, and the temperature of the sea, as I mentioned earlier, and the release condition occurs and volume and quantity. So this all played a part. Uh, I will not describe in details, but how, how they will behave uh, dependent on this. And let's look at the behavior in details right now. Press is spreading. So low viscosity oil can spread fast. This is what we have discussed earlier. And it will also lead to uh, fragmentation as well. I will talk about that in the fragmentation. So if the oil spread to a much larger area, definitely increases the complexity of response. Sometimes it spread to as large as a kilometers, thousands of uh, hundreds of kilometers square. So to survey or to respond to this kind of large area, definitely a lot more coordination, a lot more resources. Next is evaporation. So this is primarily uh, affected by volatility. And if the ambient temperature is higher, then of course the evaporation speed will be, uh, the rate of evaporation will be higher. And if the oil is spread to a large, larger area, then the evaporation rate also will be higher because you have more, uh, more area for the lighter end to escape. So what is important here would not be the response strategy itself, but rather a health and safety concern because at the end, sometimes it might be uh, it might lead to a flammable environment. So this is something really important. We want to keep people safe. And something we need to take note is that evaporation, although it's good to us, it, uh, we don't have to clean up, it will leave behind the heavy residues because, uh, you know, crude oils, it has a range of uh, uh, lights and heavy uh, uh, fragments. So if the light ends are evaporated, we'll be left with the heavy end and we still need to deal with those. Next one is natural dispersion. I think the, this picture actually best, best describe what it is. So naturally, the oil will, dis, uh, will uh, disperse into water column. And this actually increases the uh, droplet surface area for other, uh, other processes such as biodegradation and dissolution. And sometimes this is this is a uh, process that we want it to happen. So we do this by using a mechanical agitation to, to enhance this process to happen. The next one is emulsification. So this is something I have mentioned before. What it happened is that actually water gets into the, uh, the oil itself and form a stable, stable complex. And because of that, the volume increases by four to five times and aspartame content is the main uh, driving force or key factors to determine whether it is likely to create an emulsion. And often we'll see a change in the color. So once you see a different color, like from black to orange, brown, this is an indication of emulsification. Once emulsified, of course, the oil also behaves differently and that is why we need to have a change in uh, example of schemas because the sound schemas depends on a specific behavior of oil. The next one is stranding and sedimentation. This, this, this is a, something that we observe quite frequently in all oil spills. So it happens because uh, the oil get pushed to the shoreline. So it's stranded on the shoreline. You can see it's like this. Or like this, and sometimes uh, the if the sea condition is too rough, the oil becomes submerged and uh, resurface when the condition improves. When it submerge, it might actually brings together uh, some of the sediments, and slowly it will sink to the bottom, and it's the it's caught. Tarball, so this is formation of tarball, is 
because of the sediment that it contains and it actually sinks to the bottom of the uh, seabed. Um, the last one I would like to talk about is biodegradation. So this is actually the ultimate fate of oil if we do not uh, do anything. If oil, how oil itself will slowly disappear in the world because uh, there are uh, microorganisms that actually like to uh, break them down as their energy source or their food source. So after some time, depends on the oil type of, or temperature or the, the area, whether it's a, it support enough uh, growth of the microorganism. So if you actually uh, break down all the oil in the environment to a, uh, other compounds, the water-soluble compounds, and eventually water and carbon dioxide. So this is, this is actually what happens in the natural seepage as well. So if the oil is sipping naturally, it will disappear because of the biodegradation. Okay, so let's look at the next question. Back to the Montara incident. I think this is something we are all quite familiar or we know about uh, in this region. We, uh, we understand the area dispersion application was conducted as part of the oil spill response operation. So what process actually is the main driver behind the specific application? So which process did we make use of it? So I will give about uh, 30 seconds. So right now I can see there are spread of answers from, nobody shows evaporation, that's good. From biodegradation to spreading, I can see there are people who chose that. I will end the poll in 10 more seconds, and I will, des I will describe what happens and why we join as the main driver. Okay, five more seconds. Ah, that's one person who chose evaporation now. Okay, I shall end the poll. And I have shared the results, so you can see the answer here. I shall start from the one that have the most choices spreading. So spreading actually refer to the spread on water surface. That would be uh, primarily affected by the viscosity itself. So we actually do. Uh, it's not the main. It's not the main driver behind this specific application. So the next one in the higher choice is biodegradation. Yes, so actually this is the correct answer. Uh, we what we want to happen. Actually, there are two. There are two processes that we would like to enhance. First, the name you can see this person. So you want it to dis disperse. So the natural dispersion. You want to enhance this process so that the oil will uh, have a bigger surface area to form into small droplets and disperse into water columns. And lastly, the ultimate phase is actually the biodegradation. We want to have the dispersion because this allows the microorganism to break down the oil more efficiently in a faster way. So the answer would be biodegradation some of you chose this solution. So this solution refers to, uh, to how the oil dissolves itself. So this does not uh, happen in a very large extent in, uh, as part of the behavior of the oil. Only small amount of oil will actually dissolve because uh, without any, any, uh, any external chemicals, the solution happens in a small, small extent. Okay. I stop sharing the result and move on to the next slide I have. So how do we actually can predict how oil behave? So that actually actually there's a there's a this uh, software that is free and available to public. It's called Adios. 
So it has a bank of oil inside, which has been profiled. So what we need to do is actually just put in the spill data, how much, uh, what is the type of release, what is the environmental condition. Then it actually give you a prediction on what, what, uh, what are the relative dates of oil. So you can see uh, this example here, it shows about um, 40% has evaporated and about 40% remaining on the sea surface. So we know how much of L actually we need to deal with. This actually help us in preparing resources, for example, the waste management, how, what, how many, uh, how much waste management resources do we need, how much, uh, how much uh, containment recovery do we need. So this, excuse me. So just give us a guideline. So just a quick case study, how, how the processes, how, how the natural processes actually will help us in an oil spill. So what happens in 1993 is that there is a tanker MV rail, it runs aground near Shetland. This is, this is Shetland uh, in the North Sea, belongs to the Scotland, the part, Scotland part of the England. And it released 85,000 tons of crude oil. It's a lot, a lot of oil. But what actually happened is that uh, in terms of response activity, there wasn't much other than just um, monitoring the oil itself because of the weather condition. You know, we know that in, oil, uh, in North Sea, the weather condition is rough and nature of the crude oil is very light. So the natural dispersion would be uh, something that will uh, happen in large extent. So actually in the end, uh, there's minimal impact to the shoreline and most of the oil disappeared by itself after due to the weather condition. So, so this is a case study. Uh, uh, an otherwise disaster, 85,000 tons, but it did not, we did not have to do much because of the nature, the environment was in our favor. Okay, how, um, how the oil properties and the subsequent fates and behavior in the environment will affect the response strategy. I actually have a summary slide. So this summary slide uh, just provide a quick over, uh, overview. I think we will talk about all of this response strategy in the later series of the seminar. So first thing, fragmentation refers to how the oil being uh, split into several oil slicks. So again, for a larger area, we need, we need more area support. We need more monitoring because it's much larger in area right now. Straining, this definitely uh, uh, change our uh, response strategy because it will impact the shoreline. Once it impacts the shoreline, it takes a lot more effort to clean up, a lot more labor, a lot more volume of waste because uh, anything that touch oil becomes oily waste. Your the, the the debris, the rock, the sand all become oily. And the next will be emulsification. So this is the emulsion, the oil water interaction increases volume. Then what is the impact is we have to be very careful in the selection of oil schema because some rely on the specific behavior of oil. And of course, you need much more volume of storage because you are recurring much more than before it emulsified. Lastly is natural dispersion. So this is, uh, this is the case study we talked about just now. So if it is, the environment is in our favor, we don't have to do anything. We just have to monitor the response, uh, monitor the situation. What is more important is we educate and let the public and media know we are, what we are doing is actually the right thing. We are not trying to uh, delay or to, to save, save money or save our effort by not doing anything. Okay, so this is all I have for my session. Hope everyone had a uh, good session with me. Yep. I will pass it back to Norman.
Yeah, thanks, thanks, Lehern. Uh, good discussion on the causes and fates of oil spill. So just a quick question before we move on to Shah's uh, mm -hmm. session. Uh, in your spill response experience, Lehern, um, how important it is to understand the properties of oil? In your experience, you have done a lot of, or you have been involved in a lot of spill response um, implementation. So how, how, how is it important for, for you as a responder to understand the properties? Yeah, uh, that is definitely, I would say, very important. That's, that's why it's the first thing we talk about in most of our oil spill courses as well. Uh, we, we don't explicitly discuss that because this is like the back of our hand, back of our mind. Uh, it is used as a guidance. We can kind of anticipate how the oil will behave once it is being spilled. Then that is something that we... Uh, we will advise our client or we will change our equipment accordingly. Uh, of course, we, will sh we should not be solely dependent on all this because this is all a uh, theoretical approach. We still need to, example, we still need to, we still need to, uh, to observe and to see what happens on the actual ground. Then, uh, because uh, oil will, each oil spill is unique in the sense that uh, once it is put in the environment, we do not have exactly the same uh, environmental condition all the time. So we have to we have to really be on the ground and combine our combine it with uh, combine it with the properties to determine what is the most appropriate response. Okay, thank you, Lee Hearn. So again, we encourage all the participants to ask your question. We see a lot of questions already. Uh, and to our audience, uh, please check your chat box. We shared the link to the attendance and feedback form. Uh, so you can indicate on the attendance form whether you require an electronic uh, certificate. So we request the participants to complete that form and submit the form after uh, the webinar. Okay, now that uh, we understood the uh, causes and fates or what happens to the oil once it gets spilled to the marine environment, uh, our next presenter, uh, Ms. Sharina, will talk about the impacts of this oil spill into the marine uh, environment. So, Sha, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, always the, the first thing that you have to do, because now it's all, everything is done remotely, is to make sure that you can hear me fine and then you can see my screen. Thumbs up, Norman? Yeah. Okay, so um, like Norman has mentioned, uh, thank you, uh, Lihan and Norman. Uh, so the first part, uh, Lihan has talked about the causes and um, you know uh, the fates of oil. Um, now we move on into understanding uh, what are some of the impacts when this oil is being released into the marine environment. Okay. So uh, what would we like to talk about? So for the next 40 to 45 minutes, um, I'll be covering uh, a few elements. So as we know, oil spills can cause a wide range of impacts. And it's important uh, to know that it's not only to the marine environment. I think a lot of times uh, focus has always been the impact on the marine environment. But it's also to understand uh, what are the impacts on the social and economic activities as well. Um, so this is what my session will focus on, the environmental as well as socio-economic impacts of the marine oil spills. And then on top of that, we will also look at sensitivity maps and how they are actually being used as a tool to identify resources at risk. Okay, so before we look further into the impacts of marine oil spill, um, maybe what we can do is to establish some key background about the Arafura and Timor Seas region. So I'll call it the Eds region. Um, so the Eds region comprises of semi-enclosed seas. Uh, it's bordered by uh, the four littoral nations, um, Indonesia and Timor-Leste to the north, um, the Papua New Guinea to the east, and of course, Australia to the south. So this region is actually particularly important um, in connecting the waters from Pacific Ocean with Indian Ocean. So there's this thing what we call the global ocean currents. So these ocean currents in the Eds region, it flows from uh, the east to the west. And what it does is that it provides a corridor for migration uh, to numerous marine megafaunas, including endangered marine mammals as well. Okay, 
So um, the region's high productivity, I, I'm pretty sure all of you here know um, how the Eds region is actually one of the world's highest productive marine ecosystem. Um, so the region's high productivity actually sustains both small as well as large scale fisheries. Um, so things like transboundary fish stocks that actually provide livelihood for millions of people in the region. Okay? And on top of that, it is home to a vast area of natural wonders. Uh, which is why, of course, it's worrying that, you know, all these impacts of the marine debris, oil pollution, it's causing detrimental effects on our natural wonders. So this will be covered in the next few slides. Okay. Uh, there are also numerous protected areas which actually exist along the coastal areas of the Eds. So along these marine protected um, areas, excuse me, there are sea turtles, whale sharks, um, whales and dugongs, they are all migrating to find food, for example. So um, the Eds uh, region actually have been feeding grounds for numerous marine species um, due to its high productivity as well as rich marine uh, biodiversity. Okay, so other than that, the Eds region is actually extremely rich in non-living natural resources too. So uh, Lehan has actually covered uh, quite a bit on um, exploration and production. So the Eds region actually has oil and gas reserves, um, even um, the oil fields are actually being continuously developed uh, to date, actually. Okay, so this is just uh, um, some key highlights about the Eds region um, to let you actually understand why um, we are concerned about the environmental as well as socioeconomic impacts of this region. Okay, so one of the points that I highlight about the Eds region is how it is home to a range of natural wonders. So I've used this for quite a bit. Um, this part of my session, we will talk about what these natural wonders are and how an oil spill can actually negatively impact them. Okay, so what are some of the potential sensitivities likely to be impacted by an oil spill in this region? So what we have done here is categorize them. Um, as you can see, there's offshore habitats, inshore habitats, the birds and mammals, as well as the shoreline habitats. Okay, so what I've listed here are um, some of the sensitivities uh, that are within, that are common in the Eds region. So if you look at the offshore habitats, um, there are the planktons and fish, and then the inshore habitats, for example, uh, the seagrass, the coral reefs, as well as sea turtles. Okay, and then under the birds and mammals, we have uh, shorebirds, um, seabirds, as well as marine mammals as well. Okay, and then shoreline habitats, they comprise of extensive sand areas, uh, muddy substrates, we have fringing corals and coral rock because these are naturally found in many mangrove and uh, seagrass ecosystems. Okay, so for the birds and mammals, I will talk a bit more about that uh, later. So what we have consideration here is nesting colonies. So I know in the Eds region, uh, there are uh, seasons whereby there's nesting colonies of shorebirds and seabirds. And then for marine mammals, uh, the dugongs are actually uh, commonly cited as well. Okay, I will just um, have a polling question here just to uh, get you to feel um, about the Eds region. So we talk about um, how it's a home to all these natural wonders. So what percentage of the world's mangroves do you think actually exists within this region? Okay, so I see people putting in their answers. Okay, I'll just give maybe about 30 seconds more before I end the poll and then I'll share with you the answer. Okay, 10 more seconds. I still see some answers coming in. Okay, so I'll just end the poll and... Let me share the results. Okay, so if you can see here, um, actually the uh, quite a quite a range. So you have majority, you know, saying that it's between fifteen percent, twenty five percent. So actually, at sea region has about twenty five percent of the world's mangrove. So uh, if I re recall it correctly, that's about uh, forty five mangrove tree species just within the Eds region itself. So that's quite, um, uh, you know, that um, it contributes to the, you know, worrying trend of like, you know, what, uh, what are some of these uh, effects on the mangroves, for example. Okay, 
I'll just proceed on to the next one. Okay, so um, I'll just go into a bit more detail for the next few slides on uh, some of these environmental sensitivities. So typically in an um, offshore oil spill, uh, the oil actually floats on the surface of the water and um, natural dispersion actually occurs in say the top few meters of the water column. So therefore impacts to offshore species lower in the water column is actually very low. Uh, but there are, however, some species which are found in the first few meters of the water column, which may actually come into contact with the oil. So as you see here, the main concerns would be the plankton as well as the fish. So um, for plankton, um, because it forms a basis of the food chain, um, and you know, if, um, if they are adversely um, impacted, it can actually affect uh, the whole uh, food web. Okay, so um, typically for ocean water column, it contains a um, wide variety of planktonic um, organisms. So it can be, uh, we can be talking about eggs, um, larvae of fish or invertebrates, for example, which eventually they settle on the seabed. So for planktons, uh, one interesting fact is that they actually naturally suffer uh, rise and fall in population numbers. Um, it can be because of like predation or generally changes in environmental conditions. Um, um, so in an area where there is very high nutrient con con content, the plankton populations can bloom, uh, whereby numbers actually dramatically increase. Um, and then because, you know, it, it, it's a vicious cycle. So because of the increase in number, then the nutrient content can actually reduce. And then in turn, there is actually a reduction in population number. So you can see that um, there's quite a variation in, in their population number. Okay, so for adult fish, um, they are actually more uh, resilient to oil spill um, and they are said to be able to avoid oil. Um, so the concern is not so much on these uh, free swimming fish because they are less likely to be impacted. Um, however, uh, if you think about all these caged fish or we call it fish farms, for example, because they are within a fixed location, so they are actually potentially a greater risk because they are not able to avoid the exposure um, to oil in the surrounding water. So as you can see here, I've mentioned that there's actually greater impact on mariculture, fisheries, um, and populations which are close to the near shore areas. Okay. Um, the next one, um, inshore habitats. Uh, so the damage in shallow waters, for example, they are most often caused by um, oil becoming mixed into the water column. So these can actually be because of like strong wave action or for example, inappropriate use of these persons which are too close to the shore. Um, so some of you might be familiar, um, you know, within each country, some of the regulations on this person use is that you, you are not allowed to actually uh, use it too close to the shore where there are shallow waters. Um, so for example, where you have light refined products or light crude oil, um, they have become dispersed into the shallow water, leading to like high concentrations of toxic components of the oil. These can actually cause harm uh, to those living in the sediment, for example. Okay, so example of um, uh, sensitivities that are within these inshore habitats are, for example, your seagrass, coral, and then we also have uh, reptiles, for example. Um, so in terms of seagrass, so there are different species of seagrass um, that can be found in like temperate and tropical waters. So I think in ads, if I recall, I read about 15 species of seagrass beds, for example. So they actually support a very highly diverse and productive ecosystem, and it actually forms a shelter for many other organisms. So for floating oil, it's most likely to pass over seagrass beds with no um, detrimental effects. But if oil or its toxic components become mixed into these shallow inshore waters, um, uh, at very high concentration, then uh, the seagrass and also the associated organisms may actually be impacted. Um, so uh, it's interesting to understand, you know, what are the different response strategy, uh, you know, for, for all these uh, sensitivities. So when you think about cleanup operations in the vicinity of a seagrass, for example, um, you need to take utmost care because the plants can actually be easily be torn or pulled out by uh, vessel propellers or boom anchors, for example. So that's why it's actually important to understand uh, the sensitivities around the area for planners or even responders to actually think about the right um, response strategy. Okay, and then we move on to the corals. 
Um, so Ed's region is actually adjacent to the coral triangle. So this coral triangle is actually an area which contains about uh, more or less about 80% of the world's coral species. Um, so that's about 37% of um, the world's coral reef uh, fish species, for example. So that's the organism that's associated with the coral. So I think everyone here knows what the value of coral reefs. So they provide an extremely rich and diverse marine ecosystem. They are highly productive. They offer coastal protection to otherwise like exposed shorelines, for example. So the thing about corals is they are highly sensitive. So they take a long time to recover from oiling. Um, so dispersed oil, for example, it presents a greatest risk of damage to coral reefs. So the risk is highest, of course, when you have increased turbulence. If let's say you have breaking waves that encourages natural dispersion of spilled oil, like Lehan has mentioned. So uh, you know it can be an issue where dispersants are being used in such area. Um, so in addition to the coral themselves, the communities uh, which the habitat supports, they are also sensitive um, to oil. Okay. So something interesting to note is that um, actually vessel groundings, they are actually a more prevalent source of damage to coral reefs than the oil pollution itself. So there are other activities that can cause stress in corals, for example, overfishing or like increased sedimentation due to deforestation, for example. So these are activities that can actually cause um, uh, damage to coral reefs. Okay? So it's not just um, the oil pollution. Okay, and then I'll move on to reptiles. So, um, uh, like, I think within the Ed's region, the concern would be more of the sea turtles, for example. So floating oil, they actually may be a threat to marine reptiles. Um, uh, turtles in particular, they are vulnerable, especially if, let's say, well, we are talking about the nesting season. Uh, so you can have loss of eggs or hatchlings may occur because oil strands on these sandy beaches. Um, or if, let's say, the nests are disrupted uh, during a cleanup operation. Okay. So these are some of the considerations or some of the sensitivities that uh, might be at risk um, in the event of a spill. So the next one uh, we'll talk about are the birds and mammals. Um, so actually, interestingly, seabirds are actually the most vulnerable um, open water creatures. Um, and in major incidents, um, I think we have seen this in the Makondo incident, large numbers actually are affected and they may perish actually. Um, so the most common effect of oil on seabirds uh, is actually the smothering of their plumage. So that's their feathers, for example. So um, their plumage is actually the key to their survival. So it provides like insulation as well as buoyancy. Um, and the problem is that when the seabirds come into um, contact with oil, it actually interrupts this process. Uh, Seawater enters um, the protective layer of the feathers, for example, and it comes into direct contact with the skin. Um, it results in things like heat loss um, as well as uh, subsequently hypothermia. Okay, and then um, so that's uh, the second point um, with regards to ingestion. So once they are being oiled, um, a bird's natural instinct is actually to clean itself. So by preening, right? So uh, what happens is that it can actually spread the oil over like other clean areas of the body. Um, so oil is very lightly ingested and in turn it can actually cause um, serial, um, serious effects like congested lungs, um, intestinal or lung hemorrhages, for example. So uh, these are some of the concerns that we have um, or you know, some of the impacts that the oil can have on uh, seabirds, for example. Um, but given this, actually there is no direct link between like, for example, the quantity of oil spilled and the likely impact on seabirds. Um, the extent of the impact on the population uh, is actually related to uh, various factors. So for example, let's look at season. Um, for example, if you have a small spill, but it happens during a breeding season. So breeding season means that the number of, like, let's say the seabirds are very high. So it tends to have a greater impact compared to if let's say you have a large spill, but during a time of the year, when a population number in a particular area are lower. Okay, so it's actually not a direct link between um, quantity and uh, the impact on these seabirds. So it's actually also important to understand, uh, you know, which season that, you know, that it's likely that this population would be at a high number. Um, and I will link this up with my sensitivity map later. So we'll talk a bit more about that um, in a while. 
Okay, and then the next one is the marine mammals. So whales and dugongs at the edge region, they may be at risk from um, floating oil when they actually come up to surface to breathe. Um, so reports of um, oil pollution damage to these animals actually are quite rare. Um, what, are mo what is more uh, common is actually, uh, you know, uh, mammals like seals, otters that actually spend time on shore they are actually more likely to encounter and suffer from the effects of the oil. Yeah, but for um, whales and dugongs, this is how it can be impacted, although the number of cases for these, um, based on research, is, is not as common. Okay, so we'll move on to the shoreline impacts after we look at the environmental beat. So um, uh, shorelines are actually they are exposed to the effects of oil more than any other part of the marine environment. So as you can see here from the pictures, there are many different types of shoreline. So each of them exists in different environmental conditions. Um, and that will mean that they have uh, different species present and uh, with varying sensitivities, for example. So of course, when these shoreline are being impacted by oil, it actually affects their ecosystem balance. So in general, the most suitable response strategy um, is dependent on the oil type, um, the level of oiling, and then the type of shoreline impacted. So it's actually very important for you to know um, what are the sensitivities around the area. Okay, so with that, I will launch another poll. Um, if you have a look at these um, four um, shoreline ranking, uh, these four types of shoreline, these are the ones that are common in the Eds region. So you have the exposed rocky shore, the mangroves, the fine grain sandy beach, as well as mud flats and tidal flats. So my question would be, which of these shoreline do you think is the least sensitive? And then if you scroll down, you will see a second one is, which of these shoreline do you think is the most sensitive? Okay, so I start seeing people inputting. Well, I have quite a bit of a range of answers, so it's quite interesting. Okay, maybe I'll give another 20 seconds before I end the poll, then I can share with you the results. Okay, I still see things coming in. Uh, 10 more seconds. Okay, I'll end the poll and share with you the results. Um, so if you look here, I have quite a bit of a range of answer, but majority is saying that the exposed rocky shore is the least sensitive, and that is correct. And then for the most sensitive, again, majority mentioned it's mangroves, and that is the correct answer. So if you look at... Um, I will just get rid of this. So if you look at these... Uh, four different shoreline types. Um, the mangroves are actually the most sensitive, followed by mud flats and tidal flats, and then um, the sandy beach, and then finally will be the exposed rocky shore. So um, I'll just, um, I'll just uh, briefly mention why this is so. So for example, if you look at the exposed rocky shores, they are generally of high energy environment. So they have a high capacity for self-cleaning. For example, any organisms there, they tend to be more resilient to the effects of the spill. Um, that's versus if, let's say, you look at um, fine green sandy beach, they are more sensitive because it has a, 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 va a varying degree of, let's say, biodiversity or ecological sensitivity, um, dependent on location, of course. So if you have like a beach, they hold a significant social and economic status in many areas. So, and they provide resources for, for example, like fishing or a hotspot for tourism, for example. Um, and then if uh, you have mud flats and tidal flats, they are located in the intertidal zone. So generally, they are actually uh, mostly submerged, but maybe exposed uh, twice daily, for example. 
So again, these are uh, very important ecosystems because it supports like large populations of wildlife and they also form a significant barrier to um, coastal erosion, for example. Okay, and then lastly here will be your mangroves. So they are the most sensitive. Um, aside from the fact, of course, everyone knows that the mangroves um, support a high degree of biodiversity. The, these areas can actually be damaged by both chemical imbalances um, and the physical smoldering caused by the presence of oil. Um, and then that is not the only consideration. For example, you have, um, if you uh, do a cleaning up, cleaning up actually expose um, mangroves uh, should be prioritized in a sense because uh, with protection booming, for example, set up as soon as possible. Because if you have cleanup strategies whereby you bring in machineries, uh, it actually inflicts more damage than the oil alone. So avoiding both personnel and heavy machinery entering the area is actually critical. Um, when it comes to mangroves, so it's actually um, the most sensitive. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, this is a nice picture that is provided by um, Etsy. So um, I put it here to show you how, um, you know, for example, in the Etsy region, um, seaweed farming is also one of the consideration or the sensitivity in the region. And you can easily see, if, let's say you have an oil spill um, that is headed to this direction, how it can actually impact and destroy these seaweed crops. Um, and then it, on the other hand, it actually in turn, it actually affects the livelihood of these seaweed farmers. Okay, so these are some of the impacts of marine oil spill. Okay, so um, we talked about shorelines earlier. Um, so what I want to highlight here is this environmental sensitivity index from um, NOAA. Uh, this is the National Oceanic and Atmospher Atmospheric Administration. Um, it came up with this sensitivity index um, to highlight uh, shoreline rankings. Basically, it's like a rating of how sensitive an area of shoreline would be to an oil spill. Um, for example, the, the rating that you can see here, the scale goes from 1 to 10. And if you can see, it's actually also color-coded. So for example, a rank of one here represents shorelines with the least susceptibility to damage by oiling. Um, they are color-coded, for example, dark purple on the ESI maps. Um, so examples here will be like steep exposed rocky cliffs and banks. Um, why it is least sensitive? Like I've mentioned, the oil cannot penetrate into the rock. <clears throat> so it'll be washed off quickly by the waves and the tides. <clears throat> Um, if you can see, the sensitivity actually increases across the index here. So a rank of 10, um, like what I've mentioned about um, uh, salt marshes as well as the mangroves, um, it represents shorelines that are most likely to be damaged by oiling. So they appear in red. Um, so if you look here, we talk about vegetated wetlands, your mangrove swamps, your saltwater marshes. So oil in these areas, they tend to remain for a long period of time. Uh, they penetrate actually quite deeply into the substrate. So that makes your cleanup actually uh, more challenging and it can actually inflict damage to many kinds of plants and animals. Okay, So this is what an environmental sensitivity index um, aims to tell you. Okay, the next one that I'll move on. So we talk about <clears throat> um, the marine impact. So um, in, um, environmental impacts. So in addition to environmental impacts, um, it's important to take, take note that oil spill can actually cause um, very serious financial losses. Uh, these are sometimes experienced by economic sectors that rely on clean seawater or clean coastal areas. Okay, so we will look into what are some of the potential um, social economic sensitivities in the ads region that can actually be impacted by an oil spill. Okay, so um, uh, if you think about the oceanic or the coastal or even catchment areas of the ads region, they support a wide range of economic sectors. Um, I've mentioned this earlier. So we talk about small scale to industrial fisheries, and then there are also other sectors in the region like your minerals, oil and gas production industries. You have your aquaculture. Um, what else is there? Marine tourism. Uh, shipping ports and then transport related activities. So all these are actually your social economic sensitivities. So um, uh, one thing to highlight about socioeconomic um, sensitivities, they are lower 
they have lower biological use. Um, Man-made, so mostly socioeconomic um, impacts are more related to activities, uh, which has a low ecological or biological use. Um, and because of that, the intention is generally to minimize such spills to human exposure um, in such socioeconomic activities. Okay. So as you can see, this was um, what I highlighted earlier. These are some of the sensitivities that um, within the ads region that may be of concern in the event of an incident. Okay, so um, just to delve in a bit more detail into each of these sensitivities. So we talk about um, tourism. Uh, I know in the ads region, the marine-based tourism actually has been identified as a potential economic growth area. Um, of course, it delivers benefits um, through employment, through income generation, for example. And some parts of the ads region are also popular for a range of activities like your um, diving, <coughs> your boating. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah, your boating and then as well as your surfing. So <clears throat> some populated coastal areas might also have um, hotels or restaurants, for example. So it can be affected by oil um, on the water surface or on the shore, for example. So it depends on the extent to which the businesses are dependent on this coastline affected. Um, even if you think about it, if let's say, um, if you look at this second picture, if let's say, you know, the coastline has been affected by oil, uh, cleanup operations are successful, uh, your normal activities can resume. Um, it could be that media attention uh, may have actually already caused disproportionate damage to the local image because it contributes like public image of um, prolonged widespread impact, for example. So it might hinder, um, you know, tourists from coming in, um, you know, even way after the cleanup operations have been completed. Okay, and then we'll move on to the industry. So if you think about seawater, of course, it's being widely used um, in a broad range of industries. Uh, it's used as a coolant, for example. And then uh, users of seawater, they actually rely on the ability to draw clean water from the sea. So if you look at it, um, of course, your oil and gas, this is um, one of the activities that actually use seawater, for example. Um, you have agriculture. So for example, contamination of crops and animals. Um, some people might argue it's rare, but it can occur if, let's say, the spill coincides with high tides or, let's say, onshore winds, for example. So the water levels can actually rise sufficiently high enough to actually allow oil to strand uh, where the animals are grazing. Uh, so, of course, in the event of an oil spill, um, you know, uh, water intakes have to shut down as a precaution, for example, against damage to machineries or to avoid a more extensive shutdown of the entire operation. Um, so, of course, it results in um, business interruptions as well. Okay, and then we'll move on um, to the next two. So, we talk about shipping and ports. So, um, in the context of the ads region, um, if you look at sea transportation, it's actually important for movement of, let's say, general cargoes, your livestock, commodities, or mineral resources. And my understanding is also a means of transportation for millions of people particularly across, let's say, the Indonesian um, archipelago. So in Northern Australia, for example, um, major ports are actually experiencing increased activity um, um, due to like expansion in the resources sector or exports of major commodities. So can you imagine what actually this means if oil impacts like these shipping lanes and ports? So even let's say if we talk about um, vessels sailing through slicks at sea, um, they actually may require cleaning before um, some port authority actually even allow them to enter the port. So you can see that how an oil spill actually caused considerable disruption uh, to, to like uh, normal port operations, um, you know, while the vessels are actually undergoing cleaning or if vessel movements are curtailed, for example. And of course, along with that, it comes, um, you know, external pressure, especially if, you know, um, it... Um, it causes like a uh, loss in revenue, for example. Okay, and then the last bit here is on fisheries and aquaculture. So um, we talk a bit about this. So in the case of fisheries and aquaculture, they are actually cultivated in fixed locations. Um, that means that they are at a greater risk for um, physical contamination. And then, of course, oil spills can cause damage to um, 
you know, not just physical contamination, it actually causes uh, business uh, disruptions as well. Okay, and then the third point here is an interesting one. It's about public perception, actually, of um, say eating tainted seafood. Um, a loss of market confidence may, may result, leading to, let's say, price reductions or outright rejection of like seafood products by commercial buyers or even consumers. Okay, it's about their confidence level. Um, yeah, so this is some of the common impacts um, you know, of fisheries or aquaculture. Okay, so this slide here is um, talking about um, the severity of the impact, whether it's ecological or economical, for example, um, what are some of the factors that it depends on? So we talk about all types and quantity. Um, so whether it's heavy or light, so Lehan has talked a lot about this one, it determines the persistence of oil. Okay, and then oil quantity, um, obviously it determines the extent of the impact and again, the spill duration, for example. Okay, and then we talk a lot about environmental and socioeconomic sensitivities. So of course, um, where the spill incident happens and what, you know, what are some of the sensitivities that it is likely to impact. Okay, so it, de uh, it determines how severe the impact will be. The next one is on response strategy. So there could be impact from response strategy that you choose to implement as part of the cleanup process. So for example, um, if you use um, high pressure washing or high temperature on like very sensitive shorelines, um, then it might kill the biota that is actually living there or even bringing in heavy machineries to clean up mangroves, like I've mentioned. So it causes more harm uh, to the mangroves compared to you know, natural, letting it natural um, uh, clean up. Okay. And then the next one is on seasonal variation. So for example, during cold weather, when you have sea temperature uh, being low, uh, so Lehan mentioned about four points. So if let's say um, it falls below the four point, then the oil does not flow. So it tends to be, you know, be hardened or emulsified. So, um, you know, it can impact the, um, it can impact the sensitivities around the area and then the type of strategy that you need to use. Um, this can also refer to nesting season or like your migration period of certain sensitivities. So we talk about, you know, maybe migration period for the whales or the turtle nesting season. Um, so impact is more severe if the spill period actually coincides with this period. Okay. Okay. And with that, I'm on to my last bit of um, the session, which is on sensitivity maps. Okay. So... Um, what are sensitivity maps? Um, so we talk about, you know, how, uh, what are some of the sensitivities that you can consider, which is um, your environment as well as your socioeconomic sensitivities. So what sensitivity maps do is that they convey essential information to those responding to incidents by identifying uh, the sites of coastal resources or environmentally sensitive areas. So when a spill occurs, for example, this, these sensitivity maps can actually help your on-team commanders or the responders on site to meet one of the main response objectives, which is to reduce the environmental consequences of the spill and the cleanup efforts. So additionally, it's, these um, sensitivity maps are not just used during the response stage. Um, they are often very much used during the planning stage, during your peace time. It helps planners to identify which are these vulnerable locations, um, help them to establish protection priorities, identify cleanup strategies, for example. Okay, so if you look at these maps, um, what are some of the elements that are depicted on these sensitivity maps? Okay, so if you look here, this color coding, like I've mentioned, um, you know, the shoreline type. So it's the environmental, the shoreline sensitivity index. So they are ranked and color-coded according to their sensitivity of oil. So with one glance, you can have an idea of like, oh, okay, there's a red, you know, the, the high-level sensitivity here, okay? Um, and then other than that, you will have your biological resources. So the location of all these oil-sensitive animals and their habitats, for example, um, and the habitats that are themselves sensitive to spill oil, for example, your coral reefs, uh, they are shown with symbols, um, and even uh, colors, for example. Okay, so other than that, what other element will that be? Will be the location of your human use resources. So we're talking about your socioeconomic resources that are vulnerable to oil spill. So we can have like, your parks, your beaches, for example, um, or areas that could be used as 
access points for your oil spill cleanup. Okay, so this is what um, a sensitivity map uh, shows. Okay, so I'll just zoom into like um, the, the legend, for example, the, the what the mapping of biological resources are. So you see there's actually a broad range of symbols to denote these like locations of sensitive uh, resources. Um, they, are they can be color coded, it depends. So some areas can be identified as protected areas for wildlife, um, as well as endangered species. Okay. Um, and it's important to know, like, you know, when you map biological resources, they take into account the seasonality as well as life stages present, for example. So if you look at this part here, this is presenting this information by month. Okay, that's a preference. So, um, uh, you know, so it's basically to understand, okay, that maybe if let's say a spill happens in June or July, okay, I might not be too concerned about these uh, uh, shorebirds or seabirds, for example. Okay. So some subtitle habitats like your coral reefs, um, your seagrass so all, all over here, um, your kelp beds, for example, they are essential for the coastal marine biodiversity. So for these sensitive species, they, may, they are not taken into account by the shoreline ESI. So it's important to actually um, map them onto the sensitivity maps. Okay. So the next one will be, of course, the socioeconomic assets. Um, so in mapping the socioeconomic feature, the objective is not to identify all hotels or all, all restaurants or mining comprehensively, but to actually locate the activities and the areas which have the potential to suffer the greatest impact in the event of an oil spill. Um, so the relative importance of these features and the need to protect them in the event of a spill need to be um, sort of like confirmed with the, with the local community or the regional policy makers, for example. Okay, um, so you can see that um, it's also subject to high seasonal variations. So you can have like tourist season, you can have fishing season or aquaculture season, for example. So if possible, um, it's actually good to map uh, this information in as well. Okay, so I'm um, on here to the last bit. So this here to show you um, the ESI map that was developed for uh, Rotonadau Regency. Um, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Correctly, so it's a regency of like Nusa Tenggara Timur province, Indonesia. Um, it's a sparsely populated island, but it boasts quite a, a pristine um, marine environment. So in this study, this pollution hotspot area, which is the village of Rota Barat Daya, it was actually mapped as a demonstration of ESI mapping. Uh, quite an interesting project, I would say. So they use satellite image to identify the physical vulnerability of the coastal areas. So you can see actually most of the coasts are actually covered with mangroves and sandy beaches, which are considered as highly vulnerable. So you see mostly are all in red, um, uh, which are, they, they consider it's highly vulnerable as well as vulnerable. Okay. Okay, and with that, I will um, summarize my key points. So um, it's important to recognize that marine oil spills uh, not only have environmental impacts, but they also have socioeconomic impacts as well. Um, it's important to identify, um, you know, and have an inventory of these resources. What are the resources at risk? Okay, and it's also important to remember that ESI maps, for example, they are important decision support tools. So they are a critical source of information to help planners establish like protection priorities and also for responders um, to help with the decision on like, you know, which response strategy to use during an incident. Yep. And with that, I end my session. So over to you, Norman. Thank you, Sha. Uh, indeed, uh, the impacts of marine oil spill are significant. So I think uh, all of our presenters are here. So thank you, Lee Hearn. Thank you, Sha, for your insights on the topic. So I think we can proceed with the uh, with the plenary. And there are a lot of interesting questions that our audience has submitted to us. So a quick one. So I think this one would go to Lee Hearn. Uh, so most of the oil spill properties relate to physical properties. So how about the chemical uh, properties, especially the volatility, which can cause sudden kill uh, of aquatic organisms? I think the question here is, do we also look for this type of properties when we are looking for uh, when we have an oil spill? Okay, that is a 
interesting question. So uh, Norman and Shai can come in if required. So I think you are referring to the hazardous hazardous properties yeah. of a of an oil. So yeah, I think this one is more of the toxicity. Toxicity. Yeah. So that that one would well uh, in terms of uh, response strategy toxicity in towards aquatic organism definitely it is has less so impact because uh, we are looking to but well, we are looking at the physical part in terms of how we can uh, how can we recover the oil spill oil from the environment the definitely from the chemical or to- toxicity perspective we that will be more relevant in terms of the in terms of what Sharina has spoken that will be impact of them on the environment and the aquatic organism. I I do remember we had one spill before. Uh, it was a unique spill because it was a container ship collision and uh, the container ship actually was spilling both uh, crude oil and a and a specific chemical, I forgot what it is, what it was named. I think it's something to do with phosphine. So it, uh, it, is, it is a highly uh, toxic chemical. So that one actually, the, in that response, actually the oil spill and chemical response was conducted separately. And oil spill could only, oil spill response could only come in when the chemical uh, has been cleaned up. So that that was a unique situation. The chemical, if it is if it is dangerous to human responders, it come the safety comes as priority. We need to clean up with a specific, more specific, more specialized uh, gears and with more specialized people. Okay, thanks, Bihern. Uh, this another question I think for you, Lehern. So, uh, evaporation uh, could this cause explosions? It will lead to a situation that is likely to have uh, explosion. We call it flammable, flammable, flammable vapors. So, if it lead, if it accumulates to a certain extent, so it's if it goes beyond the the LDL, then that is when it's dangerous. It occurs, we do not want it to happen. That's why when we when volatility is when the oil is volatile, the top con priority is always the safety. We want to make sure the atmospheric content is safe to enter before we actually do anything. And another thing that would be of concern is the public health. We want to evacuate anyone that would be near or in the in the immediate danger zone of a uh, volatile compounds. Okay, all right. Okay, so thanks, Dear. So the next question would be for uh, both of you. So anybody can answer this, either Dear or Shah. So question is this. So it is said that the dispersant is more toxic than the oil itself. Uh, however, the dispersant application is one of the most important, one of the important mitigation in oil spill accident. So what is your opinion on this? I will give to Shah since I have spoken quite a lot. <laughs> Go ahead, Shah. Actually, it's interesting because the, the starting statement says that uh, this person is more uh, toxic Six. than oil. Mm. Um, I mean, I, I would beg to differ in a way because if, let's say, we, we look at the, uh, the good practice guide uh, by IPCA, uh, you know, they look at how um, they compare this person with a lot of like our daily consumer products, for example. So, um, and then they actually also um, show the difference between, let's say, like these persons with uh, the oil toxicity. And in general, um, Norman, what was the second statement that you mentioned after I, I, I was I was stuck with the first statement? Yeah, so basically, what is your opinion on the use of this person? Yeah, so I think um, uh, this is interesting because really it depends on the various stakeholders within, let's say, the countries uh, that you're operating. For example, um, 
you know, in some countries that I know I was working with a client whereby that country has a very strong uh, fishing, uh, fishing community, for example. So they are actually less, um, they are more reluctant to use this person because they prioritize and also they value their fishing industry, for example. Mm. But if, let's say, you look at, um, I mean, I, I would, I would uh, use Singapore as, uh, as an example. So if you look, look at Singapore, our main revenue comes in from the shipping industry. Uh, so the main response strategy, uh, we actually encourage the use of this person because then, you know, that is the most uh, efficient way to make sure that, you know, you, you free up the shipping lane, you cost as much, uh, you, you have less disruptions as possible. Um, yeah, so, but the main thing here becomes, it, it all boils down to having a good stakeholder engagement. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure some of you might hear of the term uh, net environmental benefit analysis. So it's basically outweighing the advantages and disadvantages of your response strategy versus like, you know, the impact to your economy, impact to the environment and things like that. So a lot of times uh, it depends on uh, the, uh, your stakeholders. What, what do they hold more dear, um, you know, more dearly to, for example. So, yeah, I think I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Shasto. Is it, is, it is it a fair assessment to say that although this person is an important uh, strategy, however, there's a lot of factors and criteria to consider before we can use that? Yeah, correct. Yeah. correct. Yeah. But uh, I think we just want to correct the notion that this person is more toxic than oil. I think that has yeah. been the old notion previously, but yeah. I, I don't think that would hold today, right? Yeah, yeah. So, it, it, I mean, it's a controversial, that's why I was stuck at the first. <laughs> but it, 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 it's a controversial uh, you know sort of like uh, there's a lot of discussion about it but uh, yeah but I think importantly it all boils down to your stakeholders and what is important for your economy and for your sensitivity so we'll park that other conversation for another time yeah that's, that's a good point thanks Shah. so I think this next question would be for you as well so which one in your opinion I think uh, which one of the oil spill events is more worrying uh, was it be on the water area or once the oil hit a coastal area where you have a mangrove? Uh, which would be more uh, worrying? So I think, again, I think my answer will be, it, it depends. So I think if you look at mangroves, uh, you know, the, um, the, it, it's ranked as one of the most, you know, sensitive uh, environment on, on your, for example, your, your ESI ranking. So, um, uh, yeah, and then the fact that, you know, uh, in the end, if let's say it impacts your mangroves, uh, there's not much that you can do. Uh, you know, like, like I've talked about uh, uh, net environmental benefit analysis. Is there any benefit to bringing, you know, heavy machineries, bringing in response personnel to clean up your mangroves? It causes more damage. So it's more worrying in a sense that, what uh, you know, if the oil actually impacts uh, your mangrove, then it's a bit worrying because then it takes a long time for the mangroves to actually recover from that. Mm. So then the, you know, there's a lot of consideration on like, you know, uh, preventing, uh, preventing oil from actually reaching your mangroves because mm. of the challenge in cleaning up your mangroves. Um, yeah, so actually that naturally would have to be prioritized. So in, in, in the end, you, you would have to think about how do you prevent, you might have to do a bit of shoreline booming to prevent the oil from um, entering uh, and, you know, uh, impacting the mangroves versus like, you know, all these inshore uh, habitats like your coral reefs, for example. Yeah, it's a good answer, Shah. Thanks. So next question is, I think this one's for Lee Hearn. Uh, so how many days do you think the fresh spilled oil uh, would, would it take uh, for the oil to be emulsified in a marine environment? Okay. Uh... My answer would be it depends as well. I think we, we give a lot of this answer. It's, it's not because we don't want to give you a fixed answer. Uh, how long does it take to emulsify? It depends on the on the weather condition. So if the sea condition is rough, the emulsification would take place uh, much faster. And secondly, is the oil itself. So if the oil has a lot more acetylene content, the emulsification will also occur at a much faster rate. What I can provide is that the uh, Montara crude, the emulsification was quite fast. I think it happens within days, if not hours. But I do have seen uh, other type of oil spill and it is 
much lower, probably about a week or so. That is something that we call the window opportunity for us to do much more options to because the oil is uh, fresh. There are more options for you to clean them up. So it really depends on the type of oil, huh? And the weather condition. And the weather conditions. Yeah. All right. Okay. Hope we answered that. Uh, okay. So I think we'll go to the next couple more questions. So we, there's a lot of questions raised, but as mentioned, we are not able to uh, raise all of it, but we will be uh, releasing an online article or so we'll be releasing that and then answering the questions that you have. And I think this one would be our last question for this webinar. And then this will be addressed to, uh, to Shah. Uh, Sha, so you talked about um, a lot on the marine environment, and I think uh, our webinar is really uh, focused on the marine environment. Uh, but this question is more on, so what about impacts on uh, terrestrial uh, fauna uh, when shoreline is affected? So what uh, that might be in the surroundings of mangroves or other types of habitats, such as frogs and terrestrial mammals. So what can you say about this? Um. This is interesting. So I think, uh, so usually when we develop plans as part of preparedness, so there is a document on like, you know, um, environmental impact assessment. So such a report or an assessment is actually very useful because it actually leaves, um, you know, uh, all this information that you have, like you, that, you, you, that you were talking about, like, you know, whether it's frogs or, you know, any uh, different kind of mammals or, you know, invertebrates, for example, that are, uh, that are on a particular shoreline. Um, and really, I think when we are, you know, developing, like uh, where we talk about sensitivity maps and things like that, I think a lot of times uh, this information, like this kind of um, information from the local community, or, you know, if you, if you conduct these kind of studies, like the environmental impact assessment, these are very important tools. Um, so these can actually be used during the planning stage to determine, hey, this area is like, okay, you know, it has a very high cultural, uh, you know, uh, cultural importance. Or, okay, this area, we are concerned about these kind of species of, um, uh, let's say, frogs because they are endangered and things like that. So these are some of the considerations that, uh, that will be put in. Um, and then if you have that, uh, uh, I mean, if, if, if an, an organization has that capability, you will actually map this onto your sensitivity maps as well. So that, you know, when, um, when you are, uh, as, as a planner, you use these to, to develop, you know, which are the protection priorities. And then um, even, and then these get cascaded to the response um, guys on site. You know, okay, these are areas that I'm concerned about, that the community is concerned about. So these are protection priorities that you need to think about, make sure that it doesn't get infected by oil. So yeah, so this is a really good uh, question. So if you can see from my um, presentation when we talk about sensitivity maps, it doesn't encompass everything. Yeah. Um, you know, like uh, different countries or you know different region might have uh, different sensitivities that have not been uh, talked about here, and that is again uh, that you always need to have a platform where you can have these discussions about what is important. Uh, to the stakeholders and to the to the country, for example, or, or US and organization. Yep. So, but I guess your your uh, main message there, Shah, is making sure that everyone is prepared. There's such a planning ahead, yep. Yep. so that if you have these types of incident, you will be able to address this, and you have a plan to address yep. uh, such uh, issues. Yeah. So if a local community will need to actually have their voice heard as well, they probably will be the one you know, also telling you which are, you know, I'm concerned about these species here or things like that. So, mm. yeah. All right. Thank you. Sha, Sha can you stop uh, your sharing? Oh, I haven't. Eh? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, uh, I think we extended a bit of a couple of minutes in our webinar. So, thank you very much, Lee Hearn and Sha. Uh, thank you very much for the insights on this topic. So, for our audience or our participants, please complete and submit the attendance and feedback form. So, the link was shared to you earlier uh, in the chat box. So, it's really important for us to track uh, the attendance. And again, if you request to have an electronic certificate, uh, please do so or indicate on the attendance and feedback form. Um, we would like to see you again in our next webinar uh, as part of this series. So please visit 
uh, our website, www.oilspeedresponse.com, or you can also visit um, the www.atc-program.com uh, for the announcement on our next webinar date. So just remember, uh, this is a quarterly webinar. Uh, so there will be four webinars uh, for a total uh, for this year. So again, uh, we thank all the audience for spending time with us. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your time, your questions, and your participation in this webinar. So we hope to see you in person soon. So we're still in pandemic, but hopefully we see you in person soon. But until then, uh, please keep yourselves and your family safe and well. And have a good afternoon, everyone. So thank you very much on behalf of OSRL and at C2 program. Thank you, thank everyone. You. Thank you.